I want to know how it starts for you every seven years. What is the process to getting back in touch with, with all of them and, and kind of cajoling them into participating again? Well, the first thing I do is get in touch with Granada ITV and say, you know, it's coming up. And they say, fine, you know, and every seven years they bankroll it. The budget doesn't change very much, but, you know, they bankroll it, and that's very, very important. That's one of the main reasons we've managed to keep going. And then I say to them, <clears throat> you know, it's it's going to be broadcast in the U.K., let's say, with 56 in 2012. When do you want to broadcast it? And so they have a think, and it was a big year in the U.K. this year with the Olympics, the Jubilee, et cetera, et cetera. So they say, we want to broadcast it in May of 2012. So then I do reverse engineering, and I figure out, well, when am I going to it's going to take me about four or five months to cut it, and then it takes me about six weeks to shoot it. So that looks like I'm going to shoot it in August and September of 11. So I better start coming, you know, around, let's say this is the spring of 2011, to ring people up and say, you know, we're going to do 56 up, and we're going to want to shoot it some round time, August, September, and let me know what you'll be doing during that time, and we'll try and put together you know, a plan. So that, that sort of starts backwards, really. Well, I, what are their reasons? I'm sure they run the gamut, but what are their reasons for continuing to come back to do it? I mean, do, do some of them feel like it's a necessary evil or a pain of the Yeah, neck? I think it's, it varies. I mean, the big, I must say this time, the big issue was I raised their money. You know, I, I, I moved some money around. It took uh, two or three days out of the shooting budget and put it into them because I thought um, you know that <clears throat> we're living in economically difficult times particularly in the UK and if I up their fee it would make it easier for them to say yes and I think it did so you know I, as I said I moved some money in the budget and uh, decided to pay them a bit more and I think that made the difference so I didn't have such a big drama this time getting them to do it as I you know had before but, you know, there's a variety of reasons they do do it, as you say. You know, there's a, some have a, a loyalty towards it. Some, you know, feel sort of morally obliged to do it. Others enjoy doing it. You know, some of them, you know, I mean, there's as many reasons as one can think of. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, I was thrilled this time to get as many back as I've had for decades. So, you know, that was uh, good luck for me. You know, you mentioned the economic downturn and yeah. I, I I find that every stage of their life that you've documented they they kind of have their own personality uh each film yeah. and and this this one seems very much informed by you know not only death and loss which we all experience as we get older but but also the, the economic crunch I mean they're they're feeling it yeah definitely I mean yes I think that's right I mean it would be very odd if the film didn't reflect it because you know it's the country's been in a serious downturn for about three or four years now, and you know, it, it, as every year goes on, it hits harder and harder. So, you know, I think it would have been odd if the film hadn't reflected that. I mean, I don't. I mean, one of the things I don't do is get involved in the politics of the time. Mm -hmm. I what are the political issues? But if it's a political issue that is determining their lives and their choices in life, then. What I've always thought is the politics of the film is their lives. And if their lives are being affected by certain political issues at the time, you know, that's the politics of the film. Yeah. And that sort of stuff, I don't have to seek that out. That kind of rises to the top. You know, I did try once to actually, when I did 42 Up, to deal just straight with a political issue. And that was the death of Princess Diane and I you know, I went round them all <clears throat> and got their opinions on it and all that and then I threw it all out because it wasn't didn't really shape their lives, it didn't really affect their lives and so by my definition of politics, you know, it wasn't political. You know, because the problem I have is that I never kind of give a context for each film. You know, you, you don't even know what year it was shot. Right. When you see them. I mean, you know when you see them. When it's a new film, but in the old ones, you never know really when 35 Up was shot or blah, blah, blah. So, you know, I've always decided that, as I said, that I should keep go thin on the political context because it'll only confuse people. 
you know, when I start putting all the generations together. I agree. Does that make and, sense? Yeah, it absolutely does yeah. make sense. But you know, the, the Seven Up series is such a unique uh, project. I, I think it could, it probably brings up a couple of potential hurdles. The first of which is um, you've been following them for this many decades. Obviously, the series goes goes out worldwide. They gain notoriety, so the film series itself becomes a part of their life narrative. Oh, definitely, yeah. Uh, is that has that ever been tricky um, in any way? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think. I mean, obviously, it affects their lives to some extent, particularly at the time it you know, sort of comes out and all this sort of stuff. I don't know whether it's had a profound effect. I, I can't answer that. I mean, that's a kind of psychologist question. Yeah. Um, but you know. It, it, I don't think it has. I mean, you're asking me, has it had an effect on them because of the celebrity of it? I, I, I think it hasn't. I mean, it became a bit of an issue last time at 49 when we were confronted with the real emergence of reality television, and that, that caused us some hiccups. I think they were wondering, well, what is this thing we're doing? Is it just a sophisticated reality show? Um, you know, are we part you know, of the sleaze bag? reality kind of culture or whatever mm -hmm. and why aren't we making tons and tons of money you know like they do on american idol and all this kind of stuff i mean i had to try and persuade them what i thought there was the difference between documentary and reality uh, without being judgmental you know that's no point in being that and just slagging off reality because some of it's very successful but i mean my definition was in reality you take people out of their comfort zone and put them in in whatever sort of way you do it, into some you know stressful environment or some new environment, and then see how they react to that, and that can be very illuminating. But with a documentary, you're really, in some ways, just trying to capture the reality of the moment as honestly as you can. You're not taking them outside their comfort zone. You're examining what their comfort zone is, in a way. Well, having had this as part of your life for pretty much 50 years now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm sure you have a, a very strong personal investment uh, with all of your subjects. So, yeah, sure. Th which would run counter to the objectivity we yeah. we relate to documentary filmmaking. Uh, no, I gave that, that up a long time ago. I mean, I don't know <laughs> whether one ever believes that anyway. I mean... I've had two arguments, one about the question you're raising about objectivity and the other about, you know, um, one's, you know, what, 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 the, the kind of purity of the documentary form as opposed to the fiction form. You know, I've often, because I do both, I've often had discussions about this and I've always thought it was a load of bollocks. You know, there's something pure about the documentary because every edit you make is a judgment call. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, and I've made films where I've, you know, been extremely partisan and deliberately so. You know, I've had, I mean, I'm talking about documentaries, you know, when I've absolutely felt passionate about a point and wanted to make it and I've been shameless in, you know, <clears throat> how one-sided I'll be. But, you know, I don't know what objectivity means. I mean, as I said, I gave up that with this slot because, you know, we became close. And I don't even know what objective means in a sense. Do you not care about them? Do you isolate them? Do you only appear, you know, at you know, 12 o'clock on the magic night when you're going to film them and then never see them or hear from them again after you've done it? You know, objectivity doesn't seem to be a real word in a thing like this. Now, what I prefer is words like being fair-minded and, mm -hmm. you know, not not dispassionate, but, you know, just trying to be honest and honorable and moral about my choices with them rather than objectivity because, you know, it's like being objective with your child. I mean, what does that mean? Uh, so those aren't words, purity and objectivity, that I have much time for in anything, let alone this particular series. I understand exactly what you're saying, yeah, because uh, I've had this conversation many times um, about the nature of objectivity in filmmaking and the, the nature of manipulation. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a single cut is a manipulation of, well, exactly, of yeah. a moment. My you point, know. yeah. 
Yeah. And in the end, it's the, it's the quality of the filmmaker. It's the, it's the quality of his judgment that really, you know, distinguishes a fine piece of work from an ordinary or a flawed piece of work. Yeah. Have you been surprised? Uh, I'm, I'm I'm not sure when the series first kind of debuted in in America. Yeah, the Twenty Eight uh, Up was when it was that when that was okay. a big moment for me because. I, I mean, I, I interrupt your question, but ask the question and then I'll answer what you ask me. <laughs> that's, that's, I'm sure you know what the question is. What, were you surprised by how Americans embraced the series? Yes, yeah, so very much. And I, I never wanted to bring it here for that reason, not because I don't like Americans or think they're as bright as anybody, but I thought they wouldn't get it. They wouldn't get the context. They wouldn't understand the terminology of it. You know, what's a public school? What's a private school? What's a comprehensive school? They wouldn't understand the English class system through and through and I was very reluctant to bring it here because I was very much part of my life and I didn't want people to sit there blankly looking at it but I was living in in Los Angeles at, when I was doing 28 Up and so I disappeared to make this film and then people said what is it you're doing and so I showed it to some friends and they said well boy this is good you should show this here and I said no no I mean, no one's going to understand it and they said no we would they would so I put it into the Los Angeles Film Festival and then the New York Film Festival, and it got very, very well received. And it was sort of an epiphany for me because I then realized that what I thought I was doing, I wasn't. You know, that this is not a film about the polit- social politics of the United Kingdom. You know, it's more than that. It's not just about the English caste system. It's about universal issues that, if, that anybody can, on the planet can, you know, in some ways comprehend and sympathize with or object to or whatever mm-hmm. you know it has a much more humanitarian scope to it than i gave it credit for and you know the characters easily outweigh the politics of the film i mean the narrow politics of the film so it's hard to believe but i mean that you know that moment really when i realized that it was going to be acceptable in america really made me think differently about the whole project yeah and it really is about the universal human experience is what yeah. it, is what it is what it boils yeah. down to um I, i'm curious because 28 up i think that was when i was first introduced to the series and yeah. and what was most striking on that film was neil's story yeah. and i believe he that's the period of time where he was homeless yeah. uh in scotland i think what, how did you track him down well, England's not that big a country, and uh, people like you know Neil would live off social security, you know, for, for for payments from the government, and you have to register for that. You have to have it picked up in a certain place. So they they won't tell you where someone is, but they would forward a message. And he's always been very willing to take part. He's never been one of those that has objected to it. He's never caused me any grief in that sense. I mean, he can be very particular about what he wants to do in the film, but he's never made it life difficult for me in persuading him to do it. So, you know, at 28, when he seemed to have disappeared, then Claire Lewis, who had then joined me as my, you know, researcher slash partner on this, the woman who'd done it before had died, and Claire took over at 28 and is still with me. You know, she got in touch with Social Security and you know, they said they would deliver a message to him when he was picking up his, you know, his monthly check. And that's how we got in touch with him. Wow. You know, it occurs to me that you are, I believe you're 15 years older yes, uh, uh, than your subject. Yes, yeah. Um, and I'm, so I'm sure along the way here you've you've looked at their lives and and observed them and thought, yeah, I've, I've been there. Um, yeah, no, but, Absolutely. And, has this made you more introspective about your, your own growth and your own life? Well, yeah, I think I'm a pretty introspective person. I, mean, I think I'm, I, I don't mean I'm narcissistic, but I'm very interested in people's lives and, you know, I suppose by extension, my own life. So I've always been very nosy about people, you know, even before I started this as a kid and all that, I always was gossipy and all that sort of stuff. And so, but yes, very much so. I mean, and, uh, particularly the things, you know, like parenting and whatever, things that I have done and, you know, obviously have questions to myself about whether I did a good job and all this. And I'm very interested in Neil's, uh, sorry, in Nick's issue because he and I have a, a shared experience. You know, we both left England 
and built careers in America. So the way he deals with having left his roots and the way I deal without leaving my roots, I find that. You know, with Bruce, I'm very interested, too, in his moral tone, mm. you know, his religion and his morality and, you know, the way he uses that in his work and with his children. I mean, and all of them. I mean, I see myself in all of them, which I think is what makes the program successful. Is that what, That's what all the audience do to a certain extent, to see themselves in maybe one or two or at least some common issues. And I think that's why... You know, people respond to it because it is something you can identify with. And the more mature the film gets, you know, the more bases it begins to cover and the more people can identify it because we're all getting older, whether we like it or not. Yeah. I, I want to ask you probably the question you're asked most often, uh, which is, which is, uh, you know, I'm sure that this, this has been your life's journey, this yeah. series and you're going to continue it as long as you possibly can. Yeah. It, 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 what, is, what is the future of the series beyond beyond that? I don't know. I mean, you know, maybe if I passed away and if I was the first to go, God willing I am, then maybe Claire could continue it. I don't know. I mean, I would hope it could go on, um, but you, you don't know. I mean, we may have to deal with mortality at some point during all this, and I don't know, I don't know how we'll do with that. We'll just see what happens if it happens. Mm-hmm. If we know someone's very sick and all that, you know, what will we do about it? I don't know. Um, we we'll have to wait and see. But I hope it would go on. You know, I mean, I, I'm feeling okay at the moment, so I'm game for the next one. But uh, I just think, you know, you can't answer these sort of questions. I mean, I, yeah. I haven't laid out a will for it that I handed over to so and so or whatever. You know, I think these, in, in a case like this, these things will work themselves out, you know? Yeah. I doubt whether we would bring someone new in to do it. I don't think that would work. I mean, I, you know, as you know, I also keep the same crew as much as I can. Again, the familiarity of it, the familial quality of it, Yeah. yeah. I think helps people take part in it. I mean, I wouldn't dream of replacing any of the crew because, you know, some new hot shot. Um, cameraman or soundman had appeared and whatever, you know. So, yeah, if that if that level of trust is in there, then the dynamic completely. I think changes. so, and it's you know trust across the board. It's not trust in me. It's trust in George, you know, behind the camera and all this kind of stuff. So I, d- I don't know whether it would continue with someone new at the helm. As I said, it would have to be either me or Claire continued it, you know. Right. But who, again, yeah, we, who knows? Yeah, we talked about uh, objectivity a little bit ago, but um, when you're thinking of the documentary form, and, and you know, you you also make just terrific uh, f- fictional narrative films, obviously. Sure. Um, are there disciplines that you can apply from one form to the other, or are they totally different? Well, very much so. No, I mean, I, I think the more I do it, you know, the more I realize how each one feeds the other. You know, I. I I think, for example, the structure that you learn in in, in feature films, you know, the, the putting films together, putting characters together, I think that's extremely helpful in cutting documentary films, and particularly the up film, and I have got an absolute mountain of material, you know, eight generations of them for the 56, and how do you refine that down into the eight or 18 minutes that they each get, you know, and I think that you have to have kind of some inbuilt sense of dramatic structure to be able to do that. Otherwise, I think you'd have a nervous breakdown faced with not only all the new stuff, but all the old stuff, which you have to contain. Mm. So I can see that, and I can see the other way is that when you're doing a movie, you know, again, you, you sort of search for the truth of it. And, you know, sort of keep a flexibility about what you're doing, which is one of the lessons of documentary that you have to think on your feet. Yeah. You know, when you're in the harvesting process, as I call it, of getting material, you know, you have to make pretty immediate judgments on what's, you know, what's going to be useful and what isn't, you know, what to pursue and what to abandon. So I think it gives you a kind of slightly more flexible attitude to scripts and casting and shooting and whatever than you might have if you didn't have that documentary experience. And, you know, sometimes I say Gorillas in the Mist, and, you know, it's sort of how it actually is a documentary a lot yeah. of the time. You know, in some ways, 
I mean, I remember reading a quotation, I think it was from Bertolucci, who said that, you know, doing a movie is making a documentary about the actors, in a sense, and the actor's journey to discover the characters. And, you know, to use that kind of word, I mean, I, I think that's how I feel in a way. There's a lot of a documentary about doing a movie, and there's a lot of movie about doing a documentary. And, and as I say, the more I do them, the more I think I learn about that. Mm. Do you mind if I ask you just two very quick last questions about two collaborations you've had? Sure. Uh, because years ago I, I saw an interview with Gene Hackman, uh, yeah. and he was he was talking about his favorite moments in movies, and I think he listed two or three. And one of those moments was in Class Action. Oh, really? It was it was a, I think it was a phone call in the kitchen. Oh yeah, that's favorite. right. Yeah. Uh, what 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 is it like to direct? Such an actor like Gene Hackman. Well, I loved it. I mean, he's tough, you know. I mean, he, he's a tough guy. He's been there, done it all, and knows what he wants and doesn't suffer fools gladly. But, you know, he just he's a terrific actor, and we always got on very well. I mean, you know, my feeling is, you know, when you're, you've got a great actor and the great actor gets it, you know, just get out of the way, you know. Mm-hmm. That's my feeling. And, you know, at the two occasions I've worked with him, I mean, he's... You know, he's just been able to do it. And sometimes, you know, the problem is that he's so quick at doing it and getting it. But, you know, not all actors are like that. And sometimes you have to deal with a situation where one actor in a two-hander scene needs 20 takes to get going and the other one's done it by take two. You know, and that's kind of yeah. tricky. But, um, but I, I, you know, I, I love working with him. I think he's great. And, you know, I mean, he's a little bit scary sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just, I just love him. You know. Uh, and the last, last question I wanted to ask you. Uh, I'm a big fan of film scores, uh, yeah. and you've worked with some of the great film yeah. composers in movie after yeah. movie. And the one that I always put on repeat is uh, John Barry's score for Enigma. Yeah, isn't that wonderful? Oh, oh it's gorgeous. God. I think that was his last score. You know, I may be wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my. Yeah, and it was. It was a, a gorgeous score, and um, you know it was just you know just a piece of tr- I mean just a bit of gossip about it all. It was incredibly difficult for him to do because because of tax reasons we had to make a lot of the film in Holland because there was Dutch money in it. So we built sets in Holland, and we had to do shoot the music in Holland. And the idea was that we had this magnificent Dutch orchestra playing in. A beautiful concert hall, you know. And the problem was is that this great Dutch orchestra was not used to scoring, and it's a huge skill to be able to to do film scores because you know you get the cue in front of you, you run it through and play it a couple of times, and then you do it. And, and these guys were used to rehearsing for like a month, and it was terribly frustrating for him. You know, they just simply weren't trained to sight read at the speed that normal session musicians can do it. So it was very, very stressful for him. In fact, we sort of had to pack it in and go back to London and do it there. But, um, no, I agree with you. It's, and it never really got uh, the kind of attention it deserved, but it's it's really beautiful piece of work, I thought. Yeah, so delicate and beautiful. Yeah. Mr. Apted, thank you so much. Well, thank you. Uh, all very nice to talk to you. Hope to talk to you again sometime. Your work means a lot to me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.